Today I'm talking about superatoms. And superatoms is a pretty nebulous term. It can mean a few different things in a few different contexts. The, the jargon here hasn't exactly settled down. But the specific kind of superatom I want to explore are called Rydberg polarons. That, that's a bit of a mouthful, so we're going to break it down. The first step to getting Rydberg polarons is something called Rydberg atoms, which is a special kind of atomic situation. Uh, these are named in honor of a late 1800s, early 1900s physicist by the name of Johannes Rydberg. Uh, he was a great scientist, had a middling mustache, but that's neither here nor there. And he was studying the nature of atoms and emission of radiation before we really understood what atoms were. So this is before we had an understanding of an atomic nucleus and electrons and energy levels and all of that quantum mechanical description. Uh, Rydberg was studying this. He was looking at the emission of light coming out of atoms. And he found something very peculiar. He found that when atoms emit radiation, they emit very specific wavelengths. This is something we had known for decades up until that point. And, but as, as you go to higher and higher frequencies, higher and higher energies, the differences between the energy levels of the, of the radiation that comes out gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then they just completely go away. You don't get any emission of radiation anymore. It would take another few decades before physicists understood what was going on. And the first crack at this, at understanding what was going on, is due to Niels Bohr. And Niels Bohr provided a picture of the atom that is 100% totally wrong, but has somehow become the international symbol for atoms, for physicists, for atomic physics, and, and just all of science with a, with a tight little nucleus, a, a, a small dense nucleus in the center and then the electrons orbiting around in these lazy circles just like planets orbit the sun like that is totally wrong but somehow it became a symbol for science i don't know it's one of my pet peeves uh, but the bohr model could at least explain these results even though it ultimately turned out to be incorrect where in the Bohr model, uh, Niels Bohr did envision the electrons as physically orbiting the nucleus, just like planets orbit the sun. But planets orbiting the sun can have any orbit they want. Earth could be right here, or it could be right here, or it could be over here. It can do whatever it wants. But an electron orbiting a nucleus is stuck to certain distances. It can be here, or here, or here, or here. It can't be anywhere in between. And so this explained the emission of radiation because if, if the atom, if the electron is going to jump to a lower level, it will emit a very specific amount of energy. And so that we will see that as light with a very specific frequency. But as the electron gets further and further away from the atomic nucleus, the differences between the energy levels get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the amount of radiation that comes out, the, those frequency differences become very small. And eventually the electron is just totally disconnected from the atom altogether and you don't get the radiation anymore. So a Rydberg atom is a situation where you have an atomic nucleus and then a lot of electrons really up close to that atomic nucleus and then you have one electron way out here, really, really far away from the atomic nucleus. It's not totally disconnected, it's still bound to the atom, but it's way far out there. Uh, in some cases, we can make Rydberg atoms where the electron is like a micrometer away from the atomic nucleus. That's, that's bigger than the distance, the smallest thing that the human eye can resolve. And so it's not like you can actually see the atom, but that's how big we're talking about, where an electron is way out there, but still bound to the atomic nucleus. An equivalent, if you want to think about it, is the difference between the Earth orbit around the sun and then something like the Oort cloud that is thousands of times further away from the sun. The objects in the Oort cloud are bound to our sun, but only very weakly. And so that's the uh, solar system equivalent of a Rydberg atom. So that's part one to understanding Rydberg polarons, which is to create Rydberg atoms. Now, the second ingredient we need is something called Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, and 
Again, this is a topic that requires its whole dedicated episode, but I'll give you the brief version. So there are two kinds of particles in our universe, bosons and fermions. Fermions are like the, the building blocks. So electrons, protons, quarks, neutrinos, these are all fermions. And the bosons we typically think of, in particle physics at least, are the force carriers. These are like photons and, and gluons and all the stuff like that. The key difference between, fo uh, between fermions and bosons is that a boson can share the same quantum state with another boson, whereas a fermion can't. So if I were to take a box and I was to start filling it up with fermions, putting, piling a bunch of electrons in there, they can't share the same physical state, so they just start filling up in volume and eventually they would start spilling over the top of the box. But a boson, like if I were to take a box and start shooting laser into it, I can keep shooting lasers into it as long as I want because all those photons can share the same quantum state. Now another kind of boson is a neutral atom. If I take an atom with the exact same amount of protons as an electron, so it's electrically neutral, I can turn that into a boson, but I have to work really hard for it. So what happens is I can take an atom, and at normal everyday temperatures, these atoms uh, act like particles. They bounce off of each other, they ricochet, they're like tiny little bullets bouncing around in a box. But if I start to cool things down in the box, the quantum nature of these atoms start to come out more. Their, their position and their velocity starts to become a little bit more fuzzy. They're, we're not exactly sure where they're gonna go or what they're gonna do. And as I lower and lower and lower the temperature, the quantum nature of these particles start to come out more. And if I reach a low enough temperature, like say a millionth of a Kelvin, then the quantum states of all these atoms start to overlap. And they're allowed to overlap because they are acting like bosons and they can all share a same quantum state. And this is now what we call a Bose-Einstein condensate, where we have a box of atoms that are all sharing a unified quantum state. And so now we can finally make our Rydberg polarons. We're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a Bose-Einstein condensate. We're gonna take a bunch of atoms, we're gonna chill them down to almost absolute zero. We're gonna get them to all share the same quantum state. They all overlap on each other. Then I'm gonna take one of them, just one of them, and give it a little, just a little bit of energy, just a little flick. And it, that will cause one of its electrons to go to a very, very distant shell around the atomic nucleus. I'm gonna turn that one atom into a Rydberg atom. So its electron is really, really far away, like a thousand times further away than all the other electrons. Now, the name polaron comes from the fact that when I put this electron out here, this electron starts to influence all the atoms surrounding it. It's a, it's a negative charge just hanging out. And so the atomic nuclei that are nearby, that are positively charged, they'll be a little bit attracted to the electron. And then the electrons in those atoms that surround it, they'll be a little bit repulsed by that random electron. And so they'll shift around just a little bit. And we call this situation a polaron. This is a kind of quasi-particle in physics, and quasi-particles, again, deserves its entire own episode. Uh, but quasi-particles are a situation in physics when we're looking at a material or a situation where describing the individual behavior of the electron and then the influence on its environment gets too cumbersome, and instead we can replace it with a single unified description uh, that kind of tracks the influence of this electron as it moves around. We treat it as a particle even though it's not its own unique distinct particle, and so it's a quasi-particle, and this kind of quasi-particle is called a polaron. And what makes this Rydberg polaron a superatom is the fact that because it's a Bose-Einstein condensate, you have your Rydberg atom with its nucleus and its electron shell around it, and then one electron way out here, but because you're in a Bose-Einstein condensate, all the other atoms are crammed into the same volume and sharing the same quantum state, so you end up with a bunch of atoms within the orbit of that electron. 
You have atoms stuffed inside of other atoms. You have the Bose-Einstein atoms shoved inside of the Rydberg atom. And that is a super atom. And that's super cool. Uh, this was only predicted to exist in 2016 and then observationally verified in 2018. This, and you would think that this would be a completely unstable situation, and it kind of is, it only lasts like a few microseconds, but for atomic physics, that's an incredibly long amount of time. This is actually surprisingly stable given what is going on. You're literally putting atoms inside of another atom. And while super atom may have some other uses or potential definitions, I think this one takes the cake because what could be more super than putting atoms inside of another atom? The Rydberg Polaron the best super atom ever. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. Link is down below so that you can help contribute to this show. Like, share, and subscribe if you feel like it. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.